Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Olinda Timms from Bangalore, India, working editor of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics and visiting scholar at the Bioethics Institute in the Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. I'm speaking today with Dr. James Drain, a pioneer in American bioethics and a widely recognized name globally in the area of bioethics. Good afternoon, Dr. Drain. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Linda. It is an honor to meet you. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview with You're the Indian welcome. Journal of Medical Ethics. You're welcome. Now, your journey into this area of bioethics started in the 60s when you were a Catholic priest. Yes. Tell us about some incidents and events that led to your interest in this area. Well, okay, let me try to make a resume of, of those experiences. Uh, I was a graduate of high school in 1947, and then I went to the seminary. I was there until 1951, and then in 1951 they sent me to Rome. And I was in Rome until 1956, and uh, I returned back to Arkansas, to Little Rock, and uh, was ordained a priest. The assignment I received was to teach at the seminary in Little Rock. But during the summer, they sent me to a hospital in Texarkana to stay and to take the place of the priest there who was ill and that. So I went to Texarkana as a new priest and I walked through the halls and I visited the patients. And, and uh, one afternoon, a sister stopped me and said, uh, there's a couple that I sent to your room. They need to speak to you, and so would you please go down? So I went down, and it was a young couple. I can still remember where they sat in the room, and uh, <clears throat> they were having trouble with their marriage, and the, the trouble came from sexuality and reproduction. They had too many children. They had restrictions on their sexual behaviors, and it was causing all kind of strains and, and, and difficulties. Now, I was just ordained, and I didn't have any experience with that sort of thing, so I explained what Catholic teachings on sexuality are based on, which was a natural law perspective, where you look at the structure of reality and you deduce morality from an understanding of the structure of reality. The structure of the sexual organs, I explained, was reproduction. So that reproduction, the nature of the organs, had to be respected morally. And that's where the opposition to artificial contraception, etc., comes into the church teachings. And I that was the explanation. And then, uh, what happened with that couple? Well, that couple, I found out, I was visiting again. I walked around and visited patients every day. I was walking around three or four days later, and the same nun who sent me to see them said that couple broke up. I collapsed. I fell on the floor. It was a shock to me. and. That shock was, for me, the beginning of a reconsideration of church teachings about sexuality and especially about birth control. And so you, you went back to teaching and counseling couples? I went back to teaching, but I, because of that experience with the couples, I started to try to help other couples who were having troubles. And I wound up forming even a group who met every couple weeks and we discussed issues and problems. In that, that went on for about five or six years and then another incident occurred where one of the couples broke up and I was exasperated and I I had been working on rethinking the Catholic teachings and I had 
put all of that rethought material away. And then after that experience with another couple, I grabbed the material and started driving to the newspaper. Now the newspaper published all kinds of articles because I published on the editorial page all the time. So I took that material and I was a little worried as I was doing so because I said, I don't know, I know the bishop is not going to like this. But anyway, I took it and I left it. And I said, maybe they won't publish it. It's all academic. Well, they published it. Every single piece that I gave them. And at the not only did they publish it, but other newspapers picked it up and it was published all over the United States. This challenge to the traditional church teaching and, and, and this argument for change in the church teaching. So uh, when that happened, uh, uh, about a week later, I received a visit. I was living at the seminary and I received a visit from the assistant to the bishop and he said you're expelled from the priesthood well that was a shock i mean i thought i might get punished but i didn't expect to get that kind of a punishment and i i went back to my room i had a little room in in the seminary and then the same assistant from the bishop came again and said you have to leave your room. You have to leave the building. I said, look, I have no place to go. I don't have any money. Doesn't matter. You have to leave. What so I, I had to pick up the things I had in my room and, and, and get out. And some Jewish man gave me some money to rent a room. Uh, I had all kinds of ecumenical contact with Jewish re communities, Protestant communities. So one Jewish man gave me the money for a room, and then <clears throat> uh, another person uh, put me in contact with a person whom I knew at Yale. And it was, uh, he was a famous and respected uh, theologian, Protestant theologian. He found out about what happened, and he sent me an invitation to come to Yale. So after being expelled from the priesthood and being expelled from my room, I went to New Haven and to Yale, and I took up residence at Yale University. And that's how I came to that particular area and continued research, continued trying to, to focus on and to try to improve church perspectives on that issue of birth control. And then you were at Yale for some years, you I say. I was at Yale and for some years. And then you traveled the world. And uh, how did you come to establish the Bioethics Institute here at Edinburgh? Well, well let, let, let me tell you about what was happening at Yale. At Yale, I would go out. Uh, I would go from New Haven down to Northern New York to visit a friend of mine who was the editor of Commonweal. It was a journal. It was an academic journal, and so he and I had a lot in common. And we visited every every weekend, and uh, and uh, while I was, uh, you know, doing all this. Uh, what was his name? Daniel Callahan. Daniel Callahan. Okay. People will yes. know. Well known. That, that, uh, well that known bioethicist yeah. from the yeah. Hastings. Institute. Yeah. Yes. The Hastings. He he and he he. While we were getting together, he said, "Look, I got a a, a grant, and we're going to travel around the world and look at bioethics, or look at." birth control and and in all of the different countries around the world. So we started out and we literally went around the world. And then he went home and uh, I went home and um, that was the beginning of all of our focus on birth control and I, church teachings and so that that, that after he got back, he was so influenced that he left his 
editor, editorship of Commonweal and started the Hastings Center. Institute. And Hastings is a research center for medical eth ethical problems brought back into government. And uh, I decided that also I would try to bring the perspectives and the thinking about those issues, not just to big cities, but also to rural areas. And I was coming back from what I thought was rural Notre Dame, and, uh, and uh, the plane was forced down in a snowstorm. And I was stuck in a place called Erie. And I looked at the little list of names I had for openings or job possibilities, and one of them was Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, which was right next door. Yeah. So I wasn't going to go there or even inquire about it, but I called them, and they came and got me and took me down to the university. It turns out that the president there wanted to establish a medical school, and he wanted me to be part of that movement to get a medical school started. So I wound up taking an offer that I couldn't receive, a full professor, et cetera, et cetera. And I came to Edinburgh, and I've been there ever since. We are today at Edinburgh University, yeah. where I still am. And I retired from teaching in around 1991, uh, maybe, or so, 1990, 1991. But I stayed at the university because they established this institute for me, and I continued to work in areas of medicine and ethics at the university. I'm still here. So you have uh, put out a huge body of work while you were here at Edinburgh University, uh, including a, a book that has won uh, an outstanding award. Hmm. Tell us about your work there. Well, that was a big surprise to me. I, uh, I published, uh, tried to continue to work in the area of medicine and ethics, which was a, just a beginning, a beginning discipline. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, publications, you know, were, were received rather charitably, or I thought charitably, and, uh, and I, uh, and, uh, the, um, the, uh, one of the books received a, an award, an, some international award. Of, yes. Um, this book, uh, yeah. More Humane Medicine. Yes. It, it received. A Liberal Catholic Bioethics. This yes. is the book that uh, received uh, the Outstanding Book of the Year in Health the in year. 2004. Yeah. yeah. And these are all of your publications, or some of them, uh, of your various publications and your articles and in journals and yeah. magazines. This is mm -hmm. just a section of some of the books and articles that you have written. Yeah, well, I. I, I really focused on the issues of medicine and ethics and and uh, published quite a bit uh, as you can see and uh, yes. also kept in touch with different groups and different universities and communication. So you spent some time with medicine and psychiatry as a background for your work. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well when I started in this area with the background I had in theology and philosophy I saw that what I needed was something actually experienced in medicine, because that's what the issues were about. So I started to study medicine. I went to uh, Georgetown University Medical School for a while, and then uh, Carl Menninger, whom I had met at uh, uh, New York one time uh, in uh, he, he invited me to do a residency in psychiatry. And so I studied medicine, and then I did a residency in psychiatry with him, the most prominent of all psychiatrists at that time. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, with, with that background, you know, continued to, to do the work in medical ethics. Now, since its establishment, 
Has this Bioethics Institute in Edinburgh fulfilled the vision that you had for it? Well, I think so, because uh, I had no big plans. Uh, it wasn't my idea to establish an institute. I, after that book was published, I saw a sign outside one of the rooms in the library that says the James F. Drain Bioethics Institute. And that's all I knew about. That's, and that was a big surprise, but I c continued to work there and uh, continued to try to work in, in the area of medical ethics. But I tried at the same time to invite in persons from other cultures and other nations to try to extend the reflection on medicine and ethics to a broad worldwide population. Now you worked with the, the WHO, the World Health Organization in 1990. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that uh, interface. Yeah, well, um, the, uh, the the World Health Organization um, came to see me, uh, and and they came and talked to the president of the university about giving me, uh, letting them employ me for a year and a half or so, and what I did at their direction was to visit nations and start groups to do, to study, to form medical ethics as a discipline in the nation and to form persons in the discipline who would be helpful to, person, to their citizens. And I traveled with WHO as my office then. I went to all over the world, but focused mainly on South America and Middle America and visited country by country by country. And at, at the countries I, I visited with the medical profession and I visited with the, with the governments and we formed groups in all the countries to begin to study this discipline of medical ethics and to bring especially the new thinking about, about issues like birth control and procreation to the populations. So you were the first bioethicist at the WHO? Uh, I was the first bioethicist at the WHO because bioethics came into being when these different things got into the press. And that's the way it started. And that's the way, and you know, I, down with the World Health Organization, I was down there and at their direction, going from country to country to country. Mm -hmm. And their objective was to start groups in each country that would continue this reflection on ethical issues in medicine. Okay. So you are a linguist, prolific in the Romance languages of Europe. So surely this must have been a great help uh, in your work with other countries. Well, it was one of the reasons why I, I would imagine they tapped into me, be, because uh, it happened that since they sent me to Rome as a student to study theology. Uh, in Rome, uh, the official language at the university, the, the Gregorian University, was Latin. And so I had to become conversant in and fluent in Latin. And from that base, I also extended, I also wanted to speak to Italians because they were all around me, and so I learned uh, Italian. And then yeah. when they, when, you know, uh, I was later uh, sent uh, to uh, study um, philosophy, to do, a, to do a doctorate in philosophy, and I went to the University of Madrid, so there I became conversant with Spanish. Spanish. I had a base in Spanish because I had a degree, I developed a degree at Middlebury in Spanish. So I had Spanish and, and, uh, and Italian, and I went, to, uh, during summers I went to Canada where I also learned French. So I had those Romance languages, and then from them you can extend to at least some competency, if not conversant in Romanian or Portuguese. I could understand and I could do some type of communication. That must have been very useful when you spoke to those populations about ethical issues and you had to get 
to the heart of those issues. Well, it, it is it is helpful. It is necessary because if you're going to do research and you're going to look at something like church teachings on an issue like birth control, you have to have contact with the people who are involved with this moral stand of the church. And it's the, the, the conversations with the people is what reinforced my commitment to alter, to suggest changes, to move away from that original position of opposition to every form of birth control. And so that opposition came from all of these contacts in all of those countries because everywhere I saw the same discomfort with the church opposition to all forms of birth control. So since you mentioned uh, that the church teaching uh, so strongly uh, influenced the, your writing and, and uh, your reconsideration of the teaching, how did you feel uh, soon after you were um, asked to leave the priesthood? Well, I, I didn't feel good. I felt I felt disastrous, but but I, I I felt as well that this was an issue that the church had to get around to reconsidering. This is not a matter of church doctrine. It's not a matter of scripture. It's not a matter of dogma. It's a matter of reflection by church persons about a particular issue. And so that reflection had to be looked at again and not considered as if it were an in unchangeable doctrine. So the, my focus was to try to get everybody at all the different levels in the church, the priest, the people, the, the hierarchy, to reconsider this whole thing based on new ideas. And that's where all of the different publications came because I was trying to suggest new ways of looking at it. Bioethics as a discipline is just growing in India. Can you tell us a little bit about the growth of bioethics in the United States? What are some of the factors that led to this development? Well, uh, Olinda, the, the, one of the things that led to an enormous development of bioethics in the United States. This wouldn't be in every country, but in the United States what led to an enormous development was the fact that after the Second World War, where the government invested enormous amounts of money in war and, and guns and bombs, and after that was over, they started directing that money to medicine and medical research and medical developments. Mm -hmm. And they formed, outside of Washington, a new city where all these research prog programs supported financially by the state were carried out. A new place of nothing but medical research. And associated with most of the medical research that was being done were, what do you think, medical ethics problems, questions, issues. And so the, the, the explosion of interest in bioethics in the United States came post-war by government involvement in medicine and the proliferation of questions about the proper way of treating these different areas of medicine. In your travels around the world, did you find that different cultures uh, looked differently at issues in medical ethics, or were there more similarities? Well, there were similarities and dissimilarities. I mean, about the issues with which I was mainly focused, the procreation issues, there was a great deal of similarity. Most of the countries had problems because the teachings of the church were so fixed unchangeable, unalterable, no consideration of other things, that there was this, this common problem in all of the different countries. And, and the need for reconsideration and the need for creating persons, 
competent in ethics and in medicine to bring change and to advance change and to argue positively for change in all of the different countries. Yes, because you need people who are close to the issue, uh, people who are on the ground experiencing these problems and searching for ways to address them. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 you can't do problems of, of family morality or sexual morality without involving persons involved in sexual uh, conduct. And, and uh, the, that meant involving married couples. And one of the things that came clear, became clear from my experience with the World Health Organization, and they're sending me all around, is that in every country there were similar problems. The, the people who were married and who were involved sexually had problems with excessive procreation. So the need for controlling procreation for persons became a universal issue. Mm -hmm. And the church had a stand that, according to at least the church hierarchy at the time, they wouldn't change. Yes. Moving away from uh, that issue uh, a little bit, um, let, let's talk about some uh, more recent issues in ethics and bioethics that seem to be preoccupying uh, our minds in recent time. So today, more than ever before, we are using data and artificial intelligence uh, in healthcare and medicine. Do you think that this will reduce the human intervention in medicine and healthcare and uh, alter the doctor-patient relationship and, its, and the relevance of medical ethics? Well, it won't. It won't alienate medical ethics because medical ethics will be reinforced because of all the problems generated by a focus exclusively on data and objective data as opposed to the experience of persons. So, you know, the, the perspective that I tried to bring was data, objectivity, science, that's important but it doesn't exhaust the reality that you have to consider. You have to consider that, but you have to see all of that data in the context of real persons and real relationships, real needs, real practices like sexual behaviors. All of those different things have to be brought into relationship. And so that is one of the big focuses of contemporary bioethics, is to make sure that the bioethics on the one hand, takes into consideration the data, the objective f factors, uh, the mathematical uh, conclusions of research, and at the same time, the experience of ordinary people. Good. Thank you. Do you feel that uh, the bioethics discourse across the world will make a difference in the lives of people uh, in the way healthcare is delivered with vulnerable populations? Well, I do have a hope that that will happen because if you don't have a focus academically on issues of medicine and morality, if, if that is not part of the academic community, that won't be part of the consideration in public. But if it is a part of the academic community, and if the academic community conclusions and suggestions and reform possibilities are are expressed and publicized, then there will be a reaction from the people themselves. And that's what I was always focusing on. Don't make the discipline of medical ethics simply an academic discipline. It has to be constantly interacting with real people in real situations, especially married people, especially married people with children. Yeah. Uh, you have written extensively about the positive impact of faith in medicine and ethics. But there are situations, do you think, where religion can lead to harm? Uh, and this is, could be unexpected, but religion can also have that impact. Well, re religion, like everything else, 
needs constant self-reflection. Religion has to be aware of what it stands for, what it advocates, how it behaves, and interaction with real people. That can't be put aside. And if it is, then religion is going to become possibly a distorting and an adversarial influence on human populations. It has to be kept in, in contact with real life. Real life is part, a basic, of an important part of any medical ethics. What is your message to the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics and the people involved in this forum who are committed to taking this discourse forward in India? Well, I'm, a, I'm afraid that uh, if I had an opportunity to talk to people from India, uh, I would repeat what I just told you, that my experience has been the need for moral stands, for moral laws, for moral behavior has to be in contact with real people, ordinary people, ordinary life. The, the, the Catholic perspective on morality is morality is developed from experience of real life people. It's natural law based. Real life, real reality, real structures, that has to be the base of morality. And so if you're talking about morality in the area of sexuality, sexual relations in, in marriage has to be studied and focused on. And you can't continue to do what I think was done in the Catholic Church, which was clerics in some monastic situations were articulating what they considered to be the moral obligations of, ma of women and men in marriage, whereas what they needed was the experience of men and women in marriage and not just thinking about or data from their experiments. Thank you, Dr. Drain. Thank you for talking to us. Well, I it's, talked a lot. Well, it's been a pleasure. I talked a lot. Thank you.